Hi guys, this is going to be a long one, okay? I warn you, I'm warning you now. If you're not interested, go to the end, let's listen to the conclusion. And I'm still only skimming the surface because the other day I bumped into a comment on, on Facebook, I think it was, and it claimed that Islam was a young and resilient religion which only required the proper interpretation by the right people to thrive in today's society. Now, to my horror, some people actually agreed where I strongly disagree. So I've decided to present some arguments for why I think Islam is incredibly weak. And I've, I've you know, created a structure here. Let's admit it, there isn't a chance in hell that I will ever be able to present all the reasons and all the contributing factors that make Islam so incredibly fragile and weak. But let me mention just a few. I think it's a good place to start. Well, I think anyway. Okay, so what is the very first issue? Well, in order to fix a problem, you need to recognize and acknowledge there is one. And Islam and most of the followers bravely stick their heads in the sand and deny there is a problem. But there is a huge one. And that's why Islam is dying so fast. And please don't don't come with the stupid line of Islam is the fastest growing religion. That's just primitive propaganda. So let me look at a couple of factors I think are crucial and contributing to the demise of this ideology. Now, first off, there is no such thing as a single whatever Islam. It doesn't exist as a single entity or version. Islam is based on the Quran, okay, a book used which, which has extremely vague and ambiguous language where every sentence requires interpretation and must also lack any context, something I would not expect to find when the text is said to have originated from a perfect God. This is my expectation, my personal private opinion and expectation. So we have this group of people who are convinced, for some reason, that the God as described in Islam is real and exists. They are known as Muslims where, due to the ambiguity of the primary text, the Quran, they had to find some way of explaining and somehow enhancing the useless instructions found in the book. How? Well, by inventing secondary texts attributed to a central figure, a prophet, where legend has it that he was selected by this God to help spread his feeble message. Now, unfortunately, without quality and version control. So these texts are known as the Sunnah, and they turned out to be equally useless where we have contradictions internally as well as externally and unclear wording as well as factual errors everywhere. That's probably why we have seen hundreds of subgroups develop in Islam over the last thousand years. It's all down to interpretation. And what makes Islam so weak is this identity problem, where some of these subgroups, even though they are not fundamentally different, have developed such paranoid thought patterns that they actually fight each other, physically, not just intellectually, but physically. People, Muslims, kill each other over subtle differences in their interpretation of the Quran and over some historic developments using only violence, oppression, destructions and death instead of rational arguments. So we see Muslims suffer the most at the hands of other Muslims based, and I need to let you, you know, think about this, based on the interpretations of the texts. First of, you know, the, the Quran itself, then Muhammad followed by the Sahaba, the followers, then the interpreters and the scholars all human beings who determine what a person who follows the ideas formulated in Islam must believe and do in order to please this terribly vindictive, brutal creator. These ideas are being abused, where people use the vague and ambiguous wording of the Quran to make Islam into a political ideology, still using the background of having a God in the center, but moving more and more into establishing a political entity, rather than a merely spiritual sphere of influence. Since there are too many groups, each with a different agenda, this attempt must fail. 
Another huge factor in the 21st century is that most Muslims are better than their God. Their level of morality is much higher than that of their God, their prophet and their book. Instead of doing as commanded, continuing what has been happening for centuries, blindly obeying and only thinking what they are taught to think, they are now starting this thinking process for themselves. And they realize that some sentences and some ideas are plain wicked. So a command on how to beat women until they obey their husband and master is largely rejected by most Muslims today who try to deflect the beating into something more innocuous. The same way slavery, something clearly condoned and regulated in great detail in Quran and Sunnah all the way to the slavery subset of sex slaves, this is being softened. And since this is embarrassing for them, Modern Muslims completely reject the definition of slavery and deceive others into thinking that Islamic slavery is somehow a more benign version of slavery. Now, Muhammad and his child bride are yet another example where the ideology fails badly and where the followers today need to defend and soften the plain, immoral, brutal and primitive ideas in the old texts. And I'll mention this in a bit more detail later on. So if the founder of the ideology is indeed a perfect God, the ideology should be perfect. It is not. So let's look at some of the fakes in Islam. Now earlier I said that the message of Islam is feeble. I say this because there is nothing really new and nothing positive a non-Muslim could not experience or perform. It is a different story when considering the negative parts, the slavery, misogyny and brutality that is conveyed in different ideas and enacted as in stories, analogies or plain commands. Most stories in Islam are copied from what has existed for centuries in the region and the era. Some are misunderstood and some are simply adopted to suit Arabs. Like a human from Babylon suddenly reappears in Egypt, the Jewish God has a son, and Mary is part of the Trinity. Not only that, she is now the daughter of Imran and sister of Aaron and Moses, which makes Isa, who is her son, without a real natural father, appear over a thousand years earlier than the Jesus of the New Testament of the Christians. The Quran talks about faking the death of Jesus, and virgins in heaven are anything but virgins having had sex with millions of men and then only reappearing as reconditioned, refurbished virgins. All fakes. In addition, even though Islam came around centuries after Judaism and Christianity, none of their mistakes and moral atrocities were corrected. What makes Islam so very weak is the lack of a unique positive teaching, an authentic benefit other than just a promise of things to come, well, when you're dead. What Islam does, however, is to establish itself as a political ideology, a totalitarian ideology, not just a spiritual set of teachings. Islam attempts to regulate everything, from clothing to inheritance laws, and failing at all of them. It presents itself as a test, a test of how credulous a human being can be without any chance of ever having any evidence, just blind faith. And the more faith you have, and the less evidence you require, the bigger your reward, but only once you're dead. Until then, you must adhere to the brutal, immoral and nonsensical rules and regulations every single day of your life in this universe. The regulation of human interaction, the political side, is one of the major reasons for the failure of Islam. Just like communism failed eventually, it's the people, they can't handle it. So the focus on the politics of conquest and expansion using egalitarian values are stories actually weakening Islam today. If the author of the Quran is indeed a perfect God, the stories would be perfect. Well, they're not. Let's go to apologetics. And to sum it all up and, and do a spoiler alert up front, the level of what Muslim defenders of Islam present to us non-Muslims, come on, it's pitiful and appalling. 
confronted with a contentious issue, we are merely deceived, told to go and read a different sentence and ignore the one which is causing us concerns. All I have experienced from Muslim apologists is throwing around taunts, childish challenges, logical fallacies and platitudes. Most Muslims today realize that not all is well in Islam and are now desperately trying to rescue what they can. Also, most Muslims are better than their God and cringe inside at slavery, misogyny and all the violence and logical inconsistencies. The only way out for most of them is to pretend the Quran and with it Islam is somehow correct when compared to human-made scientific findings. When this is also refuted, it gets a bit tight and a lot of Muslims then get angry and violent, which does not help in making Islam look like a viable option. The problem is that the totalitarian approach limits the thinking capabilities when it comes to critical thinking and using the scientific method. So merely quoting what others say without understanding it makes an Islamic apologist look weak and pretty silly. Yet this is what happens constantly. Even today, scientists are quote mined to make Islam appear stronger. But unfortunately, when we analyze the claims, they fall apart and make matters worse. Now, science has found more explanations, better explanations in what, 200 years than Islam in a thousand. And so many Muslims simply fabricate things like contents in the Quran apparently corresponding with what we have found out about reality using science. And again, when we analyze these claims, they fall apart and make matters worse. And then some highly dishonest Muslims come up with something they call the golden age. It's sheer fabrication and nothing but primitive propaganda linking Islam and Muslims with scientific progress. And again, when we analyze the claims, they fall apart and make matters worse. So if an outsider, a non-Muslim reads the Quran, the only thing that sticks out at the end of the day is the mixture of stories taken from older religions and beliefs, which today we know are factually wrong. So wrong, in fact, that it is almost impossible for a Muslim to find something in the Quran that is verifiably correct. So if the author of the text is indeed a God, there should be something verifiably correct in the Quran. There is not. So we're looking for confirmation. And Muslims in general are constantly looking for this confirmation of their belief and the contents of the Quran. And some Muslim apologists try and deliver this comfort by looking for confirmation in other religions, like in texts like the Bible. So anyone now looking for these claimed confirmations will soon find they don't exist and are the product of wishful thinking and confirmation bias. And no, Muhammad and his stories are not found in older texts, no matter how hard some Muslim apologists try and project him into the books, even though the Quran makes this claim. But on the other hand, can Islam exist without the existence of Jews and Christians? No, parts of the Quran presuppose knowledge derived from the Jewish and Christian Bibles. Experts such as Professor James Bellamy actively state this. One example of this is found in his book, Textual Criticism of the Quran, where in the Quran, the place of the burning bush, Mount Horeb, is translated into Tuwa or Tuwam in 2012 and 7916. So this in itself does not make sense. But if you explore this etymologically, you end up with not a place, but that he was called twice. Only with some help from the Bible from Exodus 3, do you end up in a location, a mountain. And according to Bellamy, Muhammad makes a couple of these mistakes when he heard stories from other religions and used them to construct his own version. So this calling twice is actually a mountain which you find in the Bible. Yet, when looking at the history of the Quran and Islam, people like Muhammad's wife could be Muslims without the Quran because it wasn't there yet. So then, why is the Quran deemed necessary at all? Why is it taken to be the holy text? And on top of which, with the built-in belief system, as the, you know, the Islamic fitra on top of it. 
If that exists, why do you need the Quran, the text and everything else if it is already built into you? So when reading the Quran, we're not even sure who or what authored the text. As it says, and you can see this in 69.40 and 81.19, that this is you know the word of a noble messenger. And in the first chapter, the Fatiha, it clearly says, this entire Quran is in the name of a different God. So this puts the foundation of Islam on pretty unstable feet. And if the author of the Quran were indeed a perfect God, the religion should be perfect. It is not. So let's look at the central doctrine of the Quran. The Quran is a collection of ideas, claims, vast number of threats, and countless repetitions of those. The rest consists of you know, just narcissistic, rambling monologue where the author pats himself on the shoulder at the end of nearly every sentence. The grammar is a nightmare. The morality is horrifying. The stories are illogical and the claims are false. And the purpose of the book in itself, as we have seen, is obscure. Yes, I agree and I admit, yeah, I freely admit that there are benevolent passages and pleasing rhythms on occasions, but they are far and few between and only intended for those who speak ancient Arabic. What baffles me is that some parts are simply incomprehensible, even for those who do speak ancient Arabic, who have studied it, and that subsequently followers simply follow a doctrine they themselves can't even understand and have to rely on other humans to tell them what it says. Humans they then follow because individual interpretations are not allowed and frowned upon. For years now, I have challenged Muslims to provide just one single example of a claim made in the Quran that can be demonstrated to be true. And a few have tried, I must admit, but their examples were either non-verifiable or turned out to be false. And Muslims today, living in the 21st century, have not yet found a way of dealing with the countless inconsistencies, the contradictions and mistakes in the Quran, other than simply denying them and running away from any rational conversation. And this shows how weak the messages and ideas of Islam really are. What I most commonly experience when criticizing the bad ideas in Islam is that most Muslim apologists will make claims and when these turn out to be false will point to the Bible, where there are similar claims, or ancient history, the but what about deflection, a fallacy. And this does not in any way rescue or improve the Quran or the ideas in Islam. But they have no counter-arguments and must pull these weak excuses and primitive attempts at deflecting the criticism levied by rational and skeptical non-Muslims. If this fails, I will be blamed for missing the context, as though a perfect God would require one. Then I will be accused of not having studied the by now dead language used in the Quran. And if I have, it was at the wrong university, the wrong teacher, which is why I have the wrong interpretation. Then it's the wrong scholar, the missing context. And when all else fails, I'm labeled an Islamophobe, whatever that may mean. The cutoff term invented to end all arguments, discussions and rational thinking. But all I'm doing, actually, okay, is I'm asking questions and pointing out the flaws in the text itself, the inconsistencies, the contradictions and the mistakes. I didn't write this. So instead of acknowledging and addressing these, Muslim apologists usually resort to willful ignorance, demanding I show them these instances where they are painfully obvious and have been propagated for over a thousand years. Sentences like, covered by what is covered, or succeeded after them, after them successors, are hardly awe-inspiring. And someone like Al-Razi said in times long gone, you are talking about a work which recounts ancient myths and which are at the same time full of contradictions and does not contain any useful information or explanation. And then you say, produce something like it. <laughs> yeah. And this, this quote was present on Wikipedia, as shown here, and was removed by Muslim apologists and replaced with this, a more positive description of this sarcastic critic of Islam. So if the author of the Quran is indeed a perfect God, the book should be perfect. It is not. 
And this brings us to some brute facts. This Quran, I mean, come on, this is a book that was just over 6,000 sentences, okay? So it's not a lot. And it reflects society, knowledge, and culture of the 7th century. That's what. That's all what we see. And this is why slavery, misogyny, incest, child marriage, all these things are common practices and not in any way prohibited or in some cases not even restricted. Even though today we, the society of the 21st century, consider them to be morally wrong. Now Muslims today, luckily, don't usually get their morality from the Quran and are actually embarrassed by what the people who are non-Muslims can show them in their book, the Quran, a book they themselves are not allowed to interpret. Everyone is taught to rely only on what they are told and taught by scholars. And what makes Islam so incredibly weak here is that there are only a handful of scholars who can't really address the many issues in the text, and so the followers can only use those limited resources and then we see those repeated over and over and copied all the time, even though these apologies have already been refuted multiple times. What also contributes here is the fear of normal Muslims of bringing their own ideas in here or conceding a mistake for the overall good. The stubborn refusal to acknowledge the facts or even accept a single mistake in the Quran, regardless of how tiny, weakens the ability to adapt or reform the doctrines. A huge contributing factor here is the built-in concept of punishment, harsh punishment. The message is one of fear and extortion. So most Muslims don't check anything and will rather submit. You know, this the standard human reactions of, of you know this FFF fight, flight, freeze, along with the extended reactions of submit or align, are completely eliminated. There's no choice here. There is heaven or hell, no in between. There is submission. Or punishment. But because everything is chaotic, we have what I call dualism, the voluntary cognitive dissonance, where two opposite ideas are equally valid and accepted, just applied differently. Like the threats and extortions on the one hand, and there is no compulsion claim on the other. Women are second class on the one, and treat them as the best on the other. Take and rape slaves on the one, treat them well on the other. And lastly, only submission will get you the desired reward. This is the one hand. And good deeds will count on the other. So which is it? And this list can be extended a great deal, believe you me. And all these factors weaken Islam today, where we have the internet with all the information available to most Muslims and the staunch refusal to accept this on the other. So if the author of the Quran is a perfect God, the messages should be perfect. They're not. The chaotic Quran. The heart of Islam is considered to be a book called Quran or Quran or whatever, however you want to pronounce it in Arabic. It's the recitation. It is without any kind of structure. The contents is jumbled. Sentences sometimes cover several topics and a single topic can be distributed all over the book. The contents is nonsensical to a large extent and represents a collection of claims, of ideas. Those which can be verified turn out to be wrong and all we're left with is a book full of outdated, immoral ideas and threats towards non-believers as well as incomplete instructions for believers. Now, if the author of the Quran would be a perfect God, the doctrine would be perfect, but it is not. So we get to the misunderstood Quran, because the book itself is supposed to be a recitation of what a creator slash God wants from its creation, as guidance towards salvation and eternal bliss, theoretically. When you get to it, this is blind obedience. The Quran says this same thing over and over, obey. But the tasks and commands and prohibitions are either actually missing or nonsensical. So instead of providing those who already believe this God is their Lord and Master, and that there was this chosen human being called Muhammad with useful and manageable guidance, all they get are signs, vague signs, requiring human interpretation and correction. But because the Quran is seen as the foundation of Islam, 
And the basis for all actions and interactions outlining the rulings of Sharia, the Islamic legal instructions and rulings, the weakness of this central text has consequences for everything based on it. So the Quran is nothing more than a vague and ambiguous text, there only to be misused and misinterpreted. If there is one sentence calling for some outrageous behavior, Muslim apologists will find another one which seems to say something different. And this, to the mind of the apologist, somehow cancels out the negative statement, at least in public. What happens behind closed doors is vastly different, as has been demonstrated over and over. For example, as authentic recordings obtained undercover, which were published showing how Muslims are radicalized using quote minds from Islamic texts. So a Muslim who can tell us that, you know, the local law is not the governing set of rules will point to don't obey the non-Muslims in the Quran and choose and pick what versions she or he will follow. And the same is true for the violence we witness in fringe groups based on an interpretation of the Quran focused on violence. Is the peaceful Muslim a peaceful Muslim because of Islam and the Quran? No, definitely not. And Muslims, just like all beings, are a product of their environment. And that is what makes Islam so weak. The teachings are so focused on the society of 7th century Arabia and now are increasingly rejected. Where we today, in the 21st century, we shun slavery and give women equal rights. We display tolerance towards gays and other minorities in today's day and age. So if the author of the Quran were a perfect God, the text would be perfect. It is not. So we have to go to the secondary texts. As already mentioned, the secondary texts of Islam are largely useless. Conceived and compiled by humans centuries after the events they claim happened. They reflect the ancient superstitions of the time and simply repeat what others have said in the region and the era. And this is, there's very, very little that is new or unique, except for one thing, the political foundation of Islam. And the rest is pretty much a copy of what we find in other ancient texts, the misogyny, the practices of circumcision, female genital mutilation, rejection of LGBT, fake superiority claims, and the concept of supremacy, along with the propagation of slavery, rape, and child brides. Nothing new. And that demonstrates so vividly why Islam does not fit or belong into the 21st century and turns out to be incredibly weak. The secondary texts are grouped by humans, labelled as scholars, who claim these sayings and accounts are authentic, having undergone a strict and rigorous process, but when analysed, turn out to be factually incorrect, contradictory and even fabricated. And this becomes quite obvious when discussing, for example, a little girl and her marriage to the main prophet in Islam, Muhammad. For the last thousand years, it was quite acceptable that she was six years old when being married and nine years old when Muhammad decided to have sex with her, a nine-year-old child. And this demonstrates the weakness in the text when Muslims today, in the 21st century, shy away from texts deemed authentic by Islamic scholars, where these events are confirmed. And they start looking for alternatives, no matter how arbitrary or convoluted they may be. A more strict analysis, and it doesn't matter whether it's Muslim or non-Muslim, of these texts performed using the tools available to us today further undermines the strength of these texts when the claimed authenticity is shown to be nothing but a false claim, a fallacy. So if the author of the Quran is indeed a perfect God, the substantiating texts would be perfect. They are not. So let's go to something we call, or what I call, the tertiary text. Because the problem with the Quran is that it is incomplete and what is there is vague and ambiguous, as well as factually incorrect. Almost everything requires context and explanation and interpretation, extensive fixing. And this weakens the entire, the entire ideology. Could this author slash God have done a better job? Absolutely. I mean, I could. So the, the question is, could or would a God really create this mess? A God? 
with, I mean, look at this, with a booklet called Quran, pretty much useless and incomplete. Next, a set of sayings, actions and thoughts transmitted via a single source, the one who already made a mess of the first text. This guy is now being tasked to explain and complete the primary text, but instead he makes it worse. So now humans have to come in to correct the contents of the primary and the secondary text. And since there are many of these scholars and the reference texts are so badly written, they contradict each other and deliver conflicting interpretations. So my personal expectation of perfection in a God would result in a perfect text requiring neither context nor any explanation. And here in the real world, Muslims are required to adhere to the commands issued in the Quran without getting the adequate guidance they expect and require. So the secondary text, the Sunnah, has to take the place of the Quran where it comes to everyday implementation of all the countless rules. Because these in some instances contradict the Quran, contradict each other and contain either useless or false information, human beings try to assess the nature and essence of their God and find a set of rules that would appease this God and increase the chances of followers to achieve the result they crave, eternal bliss as a reward for their misery here on earth. These human beings now issued their personal interpretation of their opinions on what Islam should be and what the rules for the followers should be. So, in actual fact, Muslims follow and think what another human has thought for them. This inability to think as an individual totally kills off all ability of critical thinking. This brainwashing and indoctrination of the followers, coupled with the ever-present command to obey and not to question, makes Islam incredibly weak, especially in today's society in the non-Muslim countries, where any conceivable information and means of checking any time of claim is readily available. Now, if the author of the Quran indeed is a perfect God, the Quran would be perfect without requiring any additional explanatory texts. It is not. It's down to human rules. So what we see at the end of the day is the human factor. And the human factor is the decisive element here. Human beings make up the rules using the existing texts in any way they want. They justify and explain this using selective quote mining and have those following them accept what they say. So it depends on the so-called scholar, what flavor Islam has, what ideas are propagated and what ideas are suppressed. Depending on human beings who are part of a particular group within a society of a particular era. And this influences the rulings what is deemed acceptable or not, disguised as Islamic or un-Islamic. And this is the biggest and most decisive weakness of Islam in my eyes and according to my analysis. The dependency on human scholars, the leaders and their versions of interpretations. This decides the attitude towards simple and little things, like how to treat Christmas. But there are also more substantial things. Decency, for example. Is it decency when you demand your young daughter covers herself in a burqa? Or you hit your wife when she is rebellious and love Muhammad in spite of all the atrocities he committed? But the rulings and even the consensus of some Islamic scholars decides the attitude in extremely important areas. Well, according to me anyway. Because for me it's important how Saudi officials label atheists namely as terrorists, or the treatment of those who leave Islam. And this shows the built-in fear of Islam today and its primary weakness. Followers are too afraid to openly discuss ideas, to stand up to challenges and accept criticism and grow from it, where critics like me actually force Muslims to think and rethink, which in turn would make them stronger and instead the weakness and cowardice take over and the apologists today will rather censor or kill a critic than to think themselves on how to address this or when they are unable to accept the consequences and follow the facts, not the fakes.
So if the creator of Islam is indeed a perfect God, the ideology would be perfect. It is not.